Hey, I'm Noble. Thanks for checking out the message today. I'm so thankful that you're here and we would love to connect with you. An easy way to do that is you can text River Connect one word to 97000. You can also go through our website and find out more about us and see what we have coming up. Lastly, if you'd like to give to the River Church, you can text an amount to 84321 or you can go to the giving tab at the top of the page. I just want to thank you for being with us today and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye now. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That's the only response, okay, that we will have from tradition in that. I have been in Israel three different times. Uh, my wife and I went about four and a half years ago. And uh, if you're in Israel, there's certain places you definitely want to go to, but one of them is called Golgotha. And Golgotha is called the place of the skull, and you can Google search images later. You're going to have fun with that one, I'm sure. But it's, it's the place where Jesus would have been crucified. And you, you get to this little mountain area, and it's called the place of the skull because as you look at this mountain, there are caves which look like eyes. And then there's a part that was a, a rock that was sticking out and then a, a cave down the bottom. It looks like a skull. Golgotha, the place of the skull where Jesus died, looks like one. Kind of interesting, back in the late 70s, early 80s, they arrested someone because this Jewish individual did not like all the people coming over because he didn't believe Jesus was Messiah. And so he rappelled down the side of the mountain and was chipping away at the stone, which is funny to me because he was literally picking the nose. Because <laughs> he wanted to, to literally deface the mountain so people would not come and make such a big deal about it. I'm sure they love our tourism dollar, but they did, did not like the idea of coming to see that. If you walk a little distance away from there, there's, there's this garden tomb. And uh, Angela and I got to go over there and with our group. We had communion together. And it's a tomb they believe Jesus was in. It, it was a, a tomb of a wealthy man, not because Jesus being wealthy. A guy named Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man, gave up his tomb. And, and that tomb, when we talked a little bit last week about tombs being above the ground, this would have been different. Uh, being a wealthy individual, his would have been carved out of the side of the mountain into the stone. And that's why they have the stone in front of it. And we talk about, for Jesus, the stone being rolled away. And we looked inside, and I'll let you know, spoiler alert, it's empty. The tomb is empty. He is risen. He's risen indeed. Yes? We've been going through a series called The Miracles at the Cross. If you've never studied this, I highly encourage you to look into this. At the time of Jesus' death, while he's on the cross, some things happen that are not just labeled in Scripture, but also in secular uh, sources also. From noon until 3 o'clock, it was darkness over the, all the earth. They said it was never like that before and hasn't been since. The darkness there. We look at it as the sun refused to work because he saw his creator on the cross dying for us. When Jesus gave up his spirit, when he finally died, the veil in the temple, the part that would separate the priests from Almighty God, this veil that was 30 feet by 60 feet and four inches thick, it would take 300 priests to hang it. It was rent in two from top to bottom, opening up access for us to God. We don't have to go through a high priest. That high priest could go back into God's presence once a year. And it would have been a scary situation. If you remember, he had bells on him to keep moving because if he died, they couldn't go get him. They had to pull him out by a, a rope on his leg to bring him out. Also, at the death of Jesus, there was an earthquake. It messed up some houses. It messed up some tombs and that. I, I looked at it as saying... The earth thought it was unnatural, or nature thought it was unnatural for the creator to die on the cross. And so he threw a temper tantrum that the earth rebelled and there's an earthquake. And what happens in our world when things are shaken? Again, a lot of these messages, you could hear my message back on our website and our app, but you can also grab eight other messages on the same topics from our other eight other locations on our website. Last week we went into one 
with Jesus' resurrection, he brought some friends back. We talked a little bit about zombies, walking dead. You, you can look at the passage yourself. It, it, it is one that's like, who were they and how long? Did they? I don't know those, but I do know this. God can give life to someone who's died. Believers will live again. Yes, believers will live again. This week I want to go into, obviously, <laughs> Easter. The resurrection of Jesus. The, the most important miracle of all time, of Jesus, not just dying for our sins and being buried, but he proved that he's God. Some of you had on Facebook, a couple of you different ones had, that uh, Jesus' death proved that he was man and Jesus' resurrection proved that he was God. Because Jesus was 100% man, 100% God. And let's look at John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. Uh, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you, in the chair in front of you. You can grab that way. But I'm going to let you know also, we'll have the verses up on the screen. And if you want any of these verses later, I can get those to you. But John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. And this is right after the crucifixion. And this will be Easter morning. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter, we just call him Peter often, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and if you're not familiar with that, the author John, that's how he references himself. Uh, yeah, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. As if he didn't love all the disciples? I, I mean, yeah, you know, his favorite. That just, that's how John referenced himself. He, he gets funny in this later too. And he said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb, both of them running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Yeah, you caught it already. We're not, I'm not going to say guys are competitive. People are competitive, right? Because if I were to say guys are competitive, some of you ladies would look at me saying, I'm more competitive than you are. I'm looking at your eyes. You guys, you know, it's true, isn't it, right? You, you, you're competitive. He has to let them know. Yeah, we were both running, but by the way, I won. I, I, I got there first. That's a very important detail. I got there first. Okay, thank you. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. There would be a section when you go to these tombs, when you had a wealthier person like this, the, the, if I have the tomb right here and I come in from, from this area, there would be a standing area here and then a slab over here. It's almost like two compartments to it. This would be a very special area for family only, where family could come in and grieve as the body's laid there. And obviously you're going to put a stone over it, partially because the decay process, the smell, all those kinds of things that are going to happen in natural and death. John comes, I think he gets to this point, he's like, he, he looks in, is it safe, is it not? I'm really not, am I my family, am I not, I mean, I am the favorite one, but, but my family doesn't know if he should go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. Well, of course, the guy who thinks he can walk on water isn't going to stop for a tomb, right? Peter, when Jesus says, yo, come on out, he just starts walking on water, is going to, that's like a hole in the back, he just barges right on in. He saw the linen clothes lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. I wrote a devotion on this. It's in the book that we have, those books that we have for every series we do, um, a book that has a study guide and then six devotions for the week on every topic. And the devotion I wrote for this topic on it was, I, I found it, I was doing some research, and they said that a carpenter, which Jesus was, Whenever he was working on a project, he had that towel off to the side. And as he's working, he'd wipe his brow, and if he cut himself, he would you know, wipe it kind of thing. And when you finally sold the piece of item or gave it to someone, you would normally give that cloth with it because it would show the, the sweat and blood that went into it. Uh, for those of you who have been on a cruise or something, maybe you've seen on how they do an animal out of a towel. Have you seen those kind of things? Some of those restaurants with the napkins, a, a, a fancy kind of fold? Well, every carpenter had his signature fold. And so if he's working on a project and you come look at the project and you're like, I would like to buy this project, 
He might look at you without even answering because the signature fold wasn't in that cloth yet. So it wasn't done. So you knew you couldn't buy it yet. I think when they looked over and saw his headpiece lying by itself, they realized it's finished. He said on the cross it's finished. And now with the resurrection, it's done. This was the plan. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, reminder, I won, also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead then the disciples went back to their homes. I want to go three, three points today, okay? I'm going to go through them pretty quickly, so listen quickly if that makes any sense at all, right? But we'll go through these and you can capture it again later. The first one I want you to realize is that there are passages where Jesus foretold his resurrection. At least four different times, Jesus said, I'm going to die and I'm going to come back to life. That's a pretty radical statement. Well, let's look at them, okay? The first one is in John 2.19. But Jesus, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, I'm sure he's saying they're like, it took 46 years for Herod with all his finances and his people to build this temple. You can't even get a building permit in three days. And then he realized, what? No, no, they're not talking about a physical building. He's talking about his body. That Jesus was literally saying, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. Let's go to another passage, Matthew 12, 40. But just as Jonah was in the three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus is telling them, Jonah, is a, it's a book in the Old Testament. You may have heard about this story about a, a man who God says to go preach this the good news of who God is to this group of people, this wicked people. And he's like, God tells him to go this way. He goes, okay, and he goes that way. And he gets on a ship, and they throw him in. He gets swallowed by a fish. He's in there for three days, three nights. It's a literal true story. And then he gets spit up on dry ground. And he's like, okay, maybe I shouldn't argue with God. And he goes there and preaches. And they all repent. And the, the, the king has a, a command for everybody to turn to the one true God. But just as he's in three days, three nights, so will be with the Son of Man. Staying in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and scribes, and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. Now, this is Jesus talking before any of this happens. He's going about preaching, doing miracles. He says, I'm, I'm going to die. Like, well, yeah, we all are. And I'm going to come back to life. Pardon? I'll be raised again just three days later. Let's continue in Matthew 17, 22 and 23. And as they were gathering Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And he'll be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. That would bother me. Yeah, I'm going to die soon. But I'm going to come back to life in three days. I'll be raised again in three days. Please understand that Jesus knew his mission. Jesus knew why he came to earth, and it's because of us. That we've all done things, said things, thought things that we're not proud of. It's called sin in the Bible. It, it divided us from God. It made a separation from us and God. We, we can't really go into his presence because of our sin. We can't go into a, in front of a holy God when we're an unholy people. And therefore, he sent his son Jesus to pay the price for our sin, to forgive us of our sins. And that was done on the cross. Yeah, they buried him. But then today, Easter, he rose again, conquering death, willing to offer us life. I'm going to tell you, I don't know your past. I don't know how great you've been or how horrible you've been. Either way, God has a plan for your life. God welcomes you right now. You could have walked into this building and said, I have no interest in God. No interest, I'm just going to check this out real quick and walk out of here knowing him, having a relationship with him. You could walk into this building and if you'd have died today, you'd have ended up in hell. But today, give your life to the Lord and know that when you die, you're going to heaven. It's, that, it's basically just a conversation with God. I can make it very simple. It's believe and repent. It's a statement that says, God, I believe you are the only 
of God. That you sent your son and only through him can I get to heaven. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. I give you my life. I'm, I don't want to serve myself anymore, follow myself, do my own way. I want to repent. I want to turn 180 and now follow you and give you my life. The second point, the measures that were taken by his enemies. Jesus announced several times, I'll be crucified, I'm going to die, and then three days later I'm going to be raised again. At least four passages that we looked at already. But let's look at Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to start in verse 62. This is after his crucifixion. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Isn't that interesting? They heard him. They're baffled by this. No one comes back to life like that. Who is he to say he's going to come back? But we should probably be careful with this. Let's continue on. Therefore, ordered the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Let the disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. In my own mind, when I read this, at face value, I'm like, okay, they put a guard there. And I'm thinking a single person. Are you with me on that one? It seems like they have this one guard there, and his, his responsibility. Actually, a guard, if you look into it, it actually means 16 men. That's 16 disciplined armed soldiers were set in place at the tomb to make sure someone didn't steal a dead body. Let me continue on in um, the passage there. Um, let me go to, excuse me, let me go to Matthew 28, the next chapter, starting in verse 11, after the resurrection. While they were going, behold, some of the guard, see, it's more than one person. Some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. He's raised again. They watch this. They don't know what to do. Some of them go into the city, talk about it. The rest of them, oh, I get what happened with them. They're like, I'm not going to tell anybody. If I'm responsible for a prisoner, whether he's dead or alive, and he escapes or is out of my custody, I don't know how to say it when you're talking about a dead body, right? But when he, if he gets away, how do you treat that person? In Acts 12, we have Peter who's in prison. An angel comes and releases him from prison and they walk out. And as soon as they see Peter out in the open, the one in charge says, wait a second, I thought I commanded him to be locked up. You did. Well, he's out. Well, who was in charge of this? These group of people. And he just says, kill him. That's how you're treated if you're not doing your job. In Acts 16, you remember this one, Paul and Silas in prison. And there's an earthquake that comes about. And the jailer, thinking that they have escaped, is thinking about taking his own life. And I go, well, we're all here. You don't need to do that. He's thinking about taking his own life because he doesn't want the humiliation on his family name, on himself, the torture, and then being put to death. Let's go back to this passage now. Realize this. Again, in Matthew 28, let me go back and start verse 11 again. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers, said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. Pay him off. You didn't do your job, so let me give you a raise. I, I just, you know, let me give you a promotion. Let me give you more finances. You do your job. You know, just tell me you were asleep on the job. That's what we want. Okay. And if it comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and the story was spread among the Jews to this day. So the story is not really 12 disciples, 11 disciples, because one disciple who betrayed him isn't in the picture now. So you have 11 disciples. One of them's Peter, probably not the one you want to go to fight battle with. He, he tried this earlier. Remember, he grabbed a sword and tried to split a guy's head, and he missed and got the ear. 
He's a fisherman. We've got, what, a tax collector. We've got these kinds of guys that they're saying, these guys came in and overtook 16 of our armed, trained men and took the body. Okay. We'll get into that a little bit more. The false report did not come from the soldiers. Please capture that. The false report did not come from the eyewitnesses. The false report came from the chief priests of what they wanted people to believe. So Jesus, my first point was, he often spoke, they would die and rise again. I love what C.S. Lewis says with this. He says he's either a liar, if someone says, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be in work on Wednesday. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What's a, a funeral? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's okay. I'll be back next Monday. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear that. But whose funeral? Mine. Pardon? Yeah, I'm going to die, but I'll be back next week to work. You either say, you're lying. You lost it. <laughs> you're a lunatic. Or as C.S. Lewis says, you're actually Lord. And in Jesus' case, it's true. He is the Lord. He is speaking the truth. Then my second point was even the enemy knew that three days later, they had heard that he would try to rise again, that something would happen, and they try to stop it. My third and last point goes in the area of, and this is a huge one because after the resurrection, Jesus stays on earth for 40 days. This isn't like weekends at Bernie's, if that makes any sense to you at all. But for 40 days, he appears to people. And a number of people. In John 20, we're told that he appeared to Mary. He then appears to disciples except for Thomas. If you remember that one, the guys come back and they say, oh, we saw Jesus. And he's like, Thomas, like, seriously? Uh, Until I see it for myself. I want to touch some scars. I want to see the scars. I, I, you guys are pranking me. He, he's not. And then the, the next verse says, and this one just baffles me, eight days later. I, I think Jesus just lets them think about it. You've heard me share what's going to happen. Process this. Read through the Old Testament. Read through the prophecy. It will make sense to you that the Messiah needed to die, but that he would rise again. And then I'm in my last passage is in 1 Corinthians 15, and in verses 3 through 8. For I deliver to you of first importance what I also received. I'm going to stop right here. What I'm going to read to you right now is of first importance. This is the most important thing I can say to you today. The most important thing you can gather from me today right now, I'm going to read to you. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day according with the Scriptures. The most important thing you can hear today is that Jesus died for our sins. Yeah, they buried him, but he rose again. He is alive. He is risen. He's risen indeed. Let me continue with the passage. It really gets intriguing. And that he appeared to Cephas, another name for Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. And you know there was women and children there also, right? Most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. A very important phrase. If you are one who underlines in your Bible, or if you have a digital copy and you can highlight something, capture that. Most of whom are still alive. He says, there were more than 500 witnesses who saw this, and a lot of them are still alive. And we have no record of any of them disputing it. No secular writings where somebody says, well, you saw it. He's like, no, I didn't. Oh, the whole group, no, they didn't. No one's saying that. He walked around for 40 days and talked with the people. Then he appeared to James and to the apostles. Most of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, which is Paul speaking there, writing that. I just want to ask, who is Jesus to you? Is he a liar? Was he crazy, a lunatic? Or do you call him Lord? 
please do not patronize God in saying, oh, he was a good moral teacher, and not call him God, not call him Lord. You, you don't have that option. Because if someone's walking around saying, oh, I'm going to die, but three days later I'm going to come to life, that's not a good teacher. You, you, you don't have that option. The options are, he lied about it. He's a lunatic. Or he's Lord. The choice comes down to you. If you want to call him Lord today, Again, a simple conversation saying, God, I know I've sinned. I don't deserve heaven. My sin separated us. Nothing I can do on my own, but you sent Jesus, who always was, is, and forever will be God, to pay the price, to die for my sin. But he's alive. He rose again. He rose again. I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. If you said that conversation, if you had that prayer right now, please let me know afterwards. If you have any other questions on this, if you would like to know for yourself on how you can find verses in the Bible, I would love to show you in the Bible on where this is stated and how you can know better for yourself. You know, Jesus conquered death to give us life. He left heaven to come to earth why? So that we can leave earth and go to heaven. He is risen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and promise of salvation for those who give their life to you. I pray if there's somebody here who doesn't know you, that today would be the day of salvation. That today they would, they would come to grips with this whole topic on who Jesus is what he has done, and they'd give their life to you. And I pray then as a community we'd come together, uh, not that we'll ever be perfect, but helping each other walk in your ways, serving each other, encouraging each other, building each other up. We thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for your love. And I pray this in my Savior's name, in Jesus' name, amen.